Hello, everybody. I'm not going to talk too loud because I'm in the cathedral, and I wanted you to see it. And sure enough, this uh, brother painting over here, I told him, oh, I might make a little video, so if you hear me talking, he said, oh, that's fine. And uh, normally it's empty, but the other day when I tried to come, the door was locked. Uh, today is still the same. It's Thursday. You saw a lot of the other videos I uploaded. And today's, you know, one of the days where I'm disoriented. And I thought, you know, those days seem like maybe you can teach. Sometimes you teach better when you have some of those problems. And even driving down here, <laughs> the streets are old. They got them all rerouted. And it would have been fairly simple for me to come up the road from Ocean Drive, Shoreline, to this church. I'd have bypassed it, go all the way around, turn, go up dead. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. I talked about Pilate in the other video. Jesus is a lamb before her shearers is dumb. Isaiah 53, he was a sacrifice that before Pilate he did not answer his accusa uh, the accusers. And Pilate, it was a witness because Pilate said, do you not hear all the things that they're accusing you of? And Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to take your life? But yet he was as a lamb before her shearers is dumb. And Peter in his letter will say, Jesus gave a good testimony in that court. He spoke truth. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And 1 Corinthians uh, 15 talks about, I think it's 15, but it talks about the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's the heart of the gospel in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Nicene Creed. The Council of Nicaea. None of these are prepared videos, but sometimes maybe it's better for me to just quote and talk. This is the Cathedral Church. You all know I do history and scripture. The Cathedral Church is every a city that you and I are in don't have cathedral churches. The one I go to when I'm in New York, St. Patrick's Cathedral. That developed as uh, the cathedral church is the, if you will, the main church of all the little outlying cities. And the, I talked a lot about the Roman Empire. I might talk a little bit about uh, the influence of how the church and the university system that we're aware of even in this day all arose out of uh, the cathedral churches the seat of the bishop, the one that those churches are over all the outlying churches, okay? So in here in South Texas, Kingsville, and where I retired as a firefighter in the other cities, they don't have the cathedral. So Corpus Christi is sort of like the overseer of, and this would be like the bishop's seat for the region. And in the, and then the development, I talked about how the fall of the Western Empire in the uh, fifth century, Later, the church took up the slack and became the structure. 
In the 8th century, you had something interesting. The popes, because Rome, the Western Empire, fell, though Byzantium lasted, the Eastern Empire, Constantinople, Turkey is in the news a lot, though that lasted until the 1400s, 15th century, and it fell to the Ottoman Turks, Turkey, NATO. But the Western Church, the Pope, they had to rely upon other forces and make uh, alliances because they had no army of their own anymore. And in the 8th century, it's a big history, okay? Uh, you have what's called the establishing of the Holy Roman Empire. And Charlemagne would be considered, he was like, there was an alliance between church and government and state. And Charlemagne would then become sort of like the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the Holy Roman Empire wasn't really... It was primarily out of, I guess you could say, Germany, Germanic Empire, but the intent was it would be like a restoration of the fallen Roman Empire, but it never really was that. But it, it provided uh, forces for, for Rome and for the Pope, and there were still a lot of battles that went on during that time of the Middle Ages. And the Holy Roman Empire, at least in name, lasted all the way up until the time of the, right at the 1800s, Napoleon, the French Revolution, okay? In theory, it lasted up until that time, though it wasn't really the same as the Western Empire. But the church system developed, uh, the university system developed really out of the cathedral churches. The main churches, you had the system, what we call feudalism, People would eventually uh, become vassals. They would say, we, uh, we need protection because there's no governmental structure after the fall of the Western Empire. So they said, we would join ourselves to lord barons, people that, land barons, people that had land and property. And you would kind of like submit and say, in order to have the protection of this private landowner's uh, troops and guards and all, we're going to go ahead and kind of like sell ourselves into servitude. But the church system, and right around the end of the first millennium, the year, uh, right at the end of the ninth, beginning of 10th century, right in that period, the churches and the cathedral churches, the main churches, which I'm in, they also provided education. Uh, many of you that have been to college have not, but you study what's called the liberal arts. And there's the seven, I couldn't name them all, but one, some more rhetoric was one, just how you learning how to give discourse. Why would they call liberal arts? Because in the early Roman Empire, the only ones that really had the ability, could afford the education, and to get it were those who were from the Latin word that we get liberty from. Uh, the free men were the only ones that were getting those educations in the early Roman uh, Empire. So that's where the term liberal arts come from, is the arts or the education that the free men were able to obtain. So the, church, uh, the cathedral churches provided sort of a schooling, an education. And eventually, universities grew out of that, okay? And you had some notable ones, Notre Dame, which is very notable. And that's where a lot of the stability and the history of our country as well, Harvard and uh, famous uh, uh, universities were dedicated to the cause of God, and that's where it all originated from. <coughs> if, I, if I could quote a few, I'll mention maybe a few that I was just discussing. In Isaiah 53, 
uh, we read, he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. The heart of the gospel, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, all the churches you see me teach on the videos. The heart of the gospel, the unifying thing, is that Jesus died, was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He took upon him the sins of the whole world, and they were upon him. And God reconciled us back to himself. Do you know the scripture says, it teaches that God, the Father, forsook the Son. And people, and it clearly teaches that. And some, and some preachers over the years, I've heard, and it surprises me, but sometimes I've heard them say, God did not forsake Jesus because it just seemed like he was forsaken because he was going through the struggles. And No, no, he did forsake him. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. We did esteem him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. The hour of darkness on the cross, Bill O'Reilly, he writes those books, Killing Kennedy, Killing Jesus. But I remember hearing an interview from Bill O'Reilly where he said, he said, Jesus was afraid to die. He, no, no, he wasn't afraid to die. That's a misreading of what happened when he was in his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane and he fell. And he said, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He told the disciples and Peter, and he said, the spirit and pray that you enter not into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, he said, but the flesh is weak. And what was Jesus struggling with? That it says, he wanted that. He said, if, if you're willing, God, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. And then he settled it. He, he would drink the cup. It was the sins of the world that would come upon him when he was on the cross. And then he would be forsaken. And so it wasn't death he was afraid of. I have a good friend of mine, a Christian friend, but he was telling me one day, he said, he said, really, it wasn't such a big thing for Jesus to have died, he said, because he was just going back to heaven, and it's not such a great sacrifice. And, but I tried to explain that to him. I said, it wasn't. I said, he experienced all of the judgment of the world, all of the judgment for all the sins of the world were upon him. And my friend was saying, but he only, you know, suffered for that short time. I said, what you have to understand is he was always with the Father. I just quoted in the Nicene Creed and consubstantial with the Father. So he never had that experience of separation that we experience because we were in sin. He never had that broken communion with God. But yet, because of the predetermined will of God, he went through. And when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced that separation. And even though in their debates, did Jesus go into what we understand as hell? Hell in its most basic definition is separation from God. Outer darkness. Okay? Okay. You're separated from God. So when he experienced that, though it wasn't, 
quote, a forever experience, but yet when you experience that outer darkness, that judgment, in a sense it was a forever experience because he never had that broken communion. He never, this is in Revelation, some people know the depths of Satan or some have experienced separation to a degree that others haven't. So that one experience that he had will be in all eternity. He's not separated from the Father. He rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven. But that experience, it is a forever experience. It says he was crucified before the foundation of the world. The plan of God was not an afterthought. Okay? It was predetermined before the fall of Adam, before original sin, before the curse, before the creation that the God had understood that that would entail once the creation would go forth. People say, didn't God know that Adam would sin? Didn't God? Of course God knew all that. That's why it was predetermined before God spoke. I taught about the Logos. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the Logos. And before God spoke that first word, and all things will come into existence, it was understood, you're going to die for the sins of the world someday. You, you will become man. Jesus will become man. So, yes, that was the, that was the plan from the beginning. <clears throat> Today, I just wanted you to finally see the inside of the cathedral. I'm going to go see Pops in a little while. But I felt it, I think it's better when I'm having difficult days to communicate because that's where Paul, it says, had a thorn in the flesh and scholars debate, what was the thorn? You know, I'm, I'm looking at the royal, they just so happened for because of the certain season it is. But, you know, when I was reading the crucifixion account yesterday, it says how they mocked him because he's... Uh, cause, he was the king of the Jews, so they're mocking him. They put that crown of thorns, they put on him a purple robe, the robe of royalty, and a scepter in his hand. They were making fun. And then they hit him. They put a bag over his head, it says. They said, prophesy. Hit him in the face. Great prophet who just... They mocked him and scourged him. Some of that we see right here on these stained glass. So he did that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? Hope you enjoyed this short clip. I made it the same day with all those other ones. God bless.